Hi everyone, welcome back to The Wondercast, a show that's all about wondering, wandering, and paying close attention to the world around us. I'm your host, Kelly Vinyl. Before we get started, I want to give a huge thank you to Flamingo Shadow, who made our awesome new theme song. You guys, they're the best. They're wonderful. They're delightful. I'm so grateful. You should definitely listen to all of their music, and I will put links in the show notes so that you can do just that. Okay, so I'm really excited for today's show because we're going to talk about how you can be a nature detective in your own backyard. But first, as always, you know I like to get that good energy flow going. Let's talk about good news and good things that people are doing in the world right now. Okay, check this out. The first American woman to walk in space has now also become the first woman to travel to the ocean's deepest depth. The name of this very impressive human, and maybe overachiever, is Dr. Kathy Sullivan, who is both an oceanographer and an astronaut, and an inspiration. <laughs> There's also an international team of field biologists who banded together to form the COVID-19 Biologging Initiative. Basically, with so many humans in lockdown, scientists have been able to get some really valuable data about you know, how humans affect wildlife. So they've been tracking movements, behavior, and even stress levels of all different kinds of animals, all with the hopes of finding some innovative ways that we can protect wildlife and kind of coexist all together. So that's pretty cool. Ooh, how about this? I like this one. A new study that came out a few weeks ago looked at how generous people are in different situations. Um, the scientists were surprised to find that people naturally want to help each other, even when it costs them something and even when uh, the motivations to help don't always align. See, there's a lot of good out there. I wasn't surprised. And finally, and possibly the greatest news of all, someone donated a bubble machine to the New Quay Zoo in Cornwall, England. <laughs> Uh, the penguins there are absolutely loving it, and the zookeepers say that the movement and the shapes and the colors of the bubbles are helping the penguins keep their predatory reflexes sharp. So that's great news. I would love to go visit them. Maybe I'll just get a bubble machine. We'll see what happens. Um, but in any case, if you have good news that you would like to submit, I would love to hear it. Send an email to wondercast at scienceatl.org, and you know I'll tell everyone. It's going to be great. You've probably noticed that this whole global pandemic thing is still very much a thing. And chances are you're feeling bored or restless, or maybe you feel like you've completely run out of things to do. You've done all the puzzles in your house, you've chased all the neighborhood kitties away, I don't know. However, might I present to you a suggestion? <laughs> Introducing Ichnology. Anybody know what that is? Nope, it's not the study of icky things. Well, sometimes. Ichnology is the study of tracks, traces, burrows, and other clues that organisms leave behind. And really, ichnology is all about solving mysteries. By following footsteps, or slime trails, or all kinds of other different traces, we can learn so much about how organisms live now and how they used to live in the past. And listen, you don't have to go all the way to the center of the earth like me. You can just go outside. You can stay home. You can do whatever you want. Ichnology can be done anywhere. When it comes to learning about ichnology, I kind of really only know a little bit of stuff. So I wanted to bring in someone who knows a ton of stuff. Luckily, I knew exactly who could help us out. Your friendly neighborhood ichnologist, Dr. Anthony Martin, but most people call him Tony. Tony is a paleontologist and a geologist, but his specialty is ichnology. He's a professor of practice at Emory University in the Department of Environmental Sciences, and he's been all over the world to study fossils. He's also written multiple amazing books, published, I don't know, a million articles, and most of all, he is such a lovely human. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. 
I really Thank you for inviting it. me, Kelly. Yeah, of course. I'm excited to talk to you because your work is just so cool. Um, and I feel like I you're disagree with you. Yeah. It's true. <laughs> One of the things that I love about Tony is he has this really inspiring way of looking at the world. He has an incredible talent for finding and celebrating joy and really, really appreciating his surroundings with wonder. His enthusiasm is totally contagious. And he always reminds me that it doesn't and shouldn't cost a million bucks to be a scientist. Just going out for a walk this morning, I was doing science and it's that easy. Yeah. Okay, so before we get all into the nitty gritty of ichnology, I was really curious about how Tony came to love this stuff to begin with. My love for science started in my backyard, and that was my backyard in Terre Haute, Indiana, when I was growing up as a kid in the 1960s. I had this fascination with natural history in general, mm. but the backyard beckoned to me. He grew up watching a TV show called Wild Kingdom, where one of the hosts would wait safely in the car while the other one would wrestle crocodiles and stuff like that. I was thinking, hey, there's a Wild Kingdom in my backyard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, was, there was something about going out in the backyard and actually watching wolf spiders capture their prey, but then also seeing praying mantises, watching bees as pollinators. That was all happening right there in my backyard. It turns out he was hooked. He was totally fascinated by the natural world and read a bazillion books from the public library to learn everything he possibly could. Like many of us, Tony wasn't exactly sure what he wanted to do when he grew up. But then he took a geology class. And that was when it really clicked, okay. when I started looking at some fossils. Eventually, he figured out that he could combine his love for biology and his love for geology by studying paleontology. Lots of ologies. There are all different types of paleontologists and ways of doing paleontology today. I can observe, I can record, mm -hmm. and sometimes it, you can put it together into a pretty interesting story. Yeah, yeah. Somewhere along the line, he discovered ichnology. Now, I was curious, where did that word even come from? I study ichnology. Ichnos is the Greek root. It means trace. Okay. Traces include tracks, trails, burrows, nests, feces, or any indirect sign that an animal or plant can leave behind as a result of its behavior. Mm. And that's really key to it, is behavior that the plant or animal has to be alive to make the trace. Like if you just drag a stick across uh, some dirt, for mm -hmm. instance, that's not a trace of the stick. The stick's dead. Ah, uh, oh. <laughs> it is a trace of you, mm -hmm. of you using the stick as a tool. Okay. So this is what to me is fascinating about ichnology, is that through the study of traces, I study behavior. And it's the products of behavior. So tracks, trails, burrows, nests, feces, whatever animals or plants leave in their environment as clues as to what they were doing a given day, that's my science. Cool. What's even better is some of that gets preserved as fossils. So then I not only study traces, I study trace fossils. Okay. So those are fossilized traces left behind and they get preserved in the geologic record. That's the coolest. And not just because fossils are cool, obviously, but because it can be really hard sometimes to figure out what to do with your life. In Tony's case, he found fossils. Or maybe fossils found him. So some know. of the other trilobites I have here, I'm going to try to hold this one up too. Mm. This one's enrolled. Okay. Ooh. Yeah, you can see it. It's rolled up like a little roly-poly bug. <laughs> oh, that is so cute. <laughs> and here's another one here. This one's smaller, so mm. look, it's smiling at you. Oh, well, that's <laughs> nice. <laughs> there you go. So I mentioned trilobites earlier. So mm -hmm. you, have, you have an animal like this one, uh -huh. this trilobite. Trilobites left tracks. They made shallow burrows. They probably made nest-like structures, too. So here I have a trace fossil of what was probably made by a trilobite. Hmm. The trilobite was moving like that. So you see this pattern, mm -hmm. and that's what's key, is to recognize these, you have to have patterns and then recognize the patterns over and over. Hmm. You train your brain, so mm -hmm. to speak. 
Mm. Train your brain to see these, and then you'll you can't unsee them. Ah. You will see them everywhere. <laughs> so it's kind of like reading. Only this is reading the earth, reading the ground. Trilobites then, in leaving these traces, they made many more of these than they left their bodies. Mm. Not all trilobites got preserved like these beautiful fossils. Sometimes we see just bits and pieces. Mm. But during the lifetime of a trilobite, it left thousands of these. So really, all of these traces are clues. I was curious though, how do you get to that point where you can really read these clues and understand what they mean? It takes lots of training, lots of repetition. It also means being wrong a lot. Mm. <laughs> so what you do is then correct yourself. So if I identified this, for instance, as, oh yes, that's a uh, crab burrow. <laughs> <laughs> My colleagues will go, no, that's totally wrong, mm. and they'd be right. Natural to want to be right, but science will always win. <laughs> yeah, science will always win. Also, there's a principle in science that I follow a lot when I'm looking at tracks, trails, burrows, trace fossils, whatever it may be, is that the simplest explanation is more likely correct. So it's called mm. Oakham's razor. Yeah, well, sometimes so people want the more have... exciting answer, right? Exactly. And that's a human tendency. We want the exciting answer. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's what I want to believe. Yeah. Then there's science. Yep, yep. <laughs> Where we test that thing, that hypothesis we just want to grab onto with both hands and say, yes, that's the hypothesis I love. I want that to be true. Mm -hmm. But also be willing to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. It's okay to be wrong. Yep. It's okay to make mistakes. Okay, so now we know what ichnology is. We know that fossils are cool. Uh, we also know that it takes repetition and training to get good at ichnology. But once you have all of those things under your belt, what can it teach us? This is the wonderful thing about trace fossils, is that very often these trace fossils show you snapshots or paleo selfies of the <laughs> animals in their original environments. Okay. Um, one I'm, I'm picking up now, and I'm hoping it'll show up. Yeah, here we go. I'll turn turn it and hope that it focuses mm -hmm. a little bit right where my finger is. Mm -hmm. That's a bird track. Oh. That's a little bird track. Yeah, and you can almost see there's a little nematode trail right there. So this bird was foraging along a lake shore. <laughs> 50 million years ago, these snapshots of life at that time can give us some insights then in how, say, birds evolved certain behaviors. Birds we also know, going further back, are dinosaurs. Uh, uh, they are descended, they have evolved out of dinosaurian lineages. Mm -hmm. And we can tell that again from tracks. So now I have, uh, this is a epoxy resin cast of a Dinosaur track. Yeah, that's so cool. <laughs> Put on your 3D goggles. What's neat is look at this, three toes, one, two, three. Yeah. So the bird track I showed you earlier, three toes. Mm -hmm. This tells us something about uh, some of the evolutionary connections between these carnivorous dinosaurs that evolved starting about 230 million years ago going all the way up to the birds that we see in our backyard. So interesting. It's like you're a detective, but like a yes. time-traveling detective. <laughs> a time-traveling Nancy Drew. Yeah. Something like that. So for all you youngins out there, for anyone who doesn't know, Nancy Drew is the OG mystery-solving detective. She's the best. The book series started in 1930, I think, and there's over 500 books by now. Uh, and you can probably definitely still check them out at a library, I probably, right? Anyway, Tony told me that the ability to do this detective work, like Nancy Drew, is actually what makes us human. He teaches about this in one of his classes. So something I say to the students is that if you say, I can't track, so what you're saying is I'm not human. Ah. Uh. That tracking is actually part of being human. And when we are reading words, for instance, or if we're reading uh, symbols, 
we're doing pattern recognition that then translates into a language. And then that language, even better, can translate into a story. Okay, let's think about that for just a second. Looking at tracks helps you notice patterns. And noticing patterns helps you speak the language of science. And the more you learn how to speak all these languages of science, the better you can put pieces together to tell a story. Another thing that's great about being human is using all these senses that we have. What's cool about fossils is that you can feel them too. Mm, yeah. There's actually a paleontologist who's a pretty famous paleontologist who has uh, his entire career, he's been legally blind and he studies uh, snails, Okay. the evolution of snails. So he can feel a fossil snail and he can feel a modern snail. He can identify them. So this is something that I, I tell my students, try to use as many of your senses as you can when you are observing and interpreting what's happening around you. I don't recommend taste too often. <laughs> Generally not the best idea, probably. You heard it here first. Okay, so I wanted to learn more about the types of stories that we can tell by touching and smelling and tasting or not tasting fossils. And why not start with snails? So I have here, for instance, this is just a little snail shell. So it's a, let me try to put it up here. Oh, isn't it cute? It's so cute. <laughs> yeah, it's really pretty. Now you can see why it is nicknamed a moon snail. Mm. Kind of looks like, yeah, kind of circular. It kind of looks like the moon. Yeah. Sometimes it's nicknamed a shark eye. Oh. Mmm. You can find these on the Georgia coast. This shell has a story. And it's right there. Oh. A portal. Oh, it's a little, it could be a portal. It's a little hole. Mm -hmm. And you're thinking, oh, how nice. How convenient. Somebody drilled a hole for me. <laughs> so now I can wear it as an earring. Oh, yeah. But that's not the story. Uh-oh. This is a trace of dun 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 cannibalism. Oh. Mm -hmm. Oh dear. Another snail? Another moon snail killed and ate this moon snail. Wow. Wow. Didn't see that coming, did you? Nope, sure did not. Wait, but how does a snail drill a hole? Here's what's really cool about it. What happens is the other moon snail, which is probably bigger than this one, engulfs it. It engulfs it with its foot. So it kind of envelops it with oh. its fleshy foot. Okay. As it envelops it, it then has this little raspy drill-like thing inside of it, a little file in its tongue called oh. a proboscis. Okay. And it starts rotating it rotating, rotating, eventually drills in, like wearing away at the shell. Once it has reached inside, it inserts its proboscis in and starts eating it while it's alive. Oh, wow. Wait, so how long does it take? It seems like that might be a slow, a slow burn. Pretty there. slow, agonizing death, yeah. So think about that when you're wearing it as a <laughs> Okay, that's really, really cool and gross and cool. But I wanted to know how can technology improve our lives in the future? Yeah, I've been thinking about that with regard to climate change. We've been through this before. The earth has changed before. The earth has had really warm periods uh -huh. before. Now what's happening now, it's, it's us. We're doing it, number yep. one. Yep. Number two, it's happening very fast. It's really quick. Uh -uh. Uh -oh. Yeah, so what we can do then is look at traces in the fossil record. How did organisms respond? How did they adapt? Traces record what happened. When you read that story in order, you can start understanding how did those plants and animals deal with this? How did they adapt to that environment? Mm -hmm. Those can be then valuable lessons that we might be able to learn from that and be able to to adapt to our uncertain future, yeah, as well as helping a lot of other plants and animals along the way. It's okay. not just about okay. us. I love that. So it's not just about putting all these pieces together and figuring out how to tell a story, but really what we can learn from the story. So of course, I had to ask Tony, what are the types of stories that he's most interested in learning and telling? 
lately in the past uh, seven years or so, I've been writing books. Yes. And with this book, it's trying to popularize technology so that mm -hmm. technology and technologists, those become more household words. Technology, I've noticed, causes people to go, hick, 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 what? Mm -hmm. that's, that's one of my goals lately and what I've been doing. Yeah, with books, it's been really fun to keep that cycle going by sharing that feeling of joy of discovery with readers. The readers also, they can have that feeling on their own. They can do that in their backyard, go out and look for ant nests, look for worm poop. I want to instill that feeling in my readers. You don't have to be an adventuring gung-ho explorer. I am in the Antarctic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's cool, but you don't have to do that Right. to still have that feeling. So that's what I'm trying to do with my books. You can still discover things on your own. You can have that joy of discovery in everyday ordinary things. And then you find out they're not really ordinary. They're extraordinary. Yeah. So maybe you're wondering, how do you fit into this? How can you try out technology on your own? If you want to be part of the revolution, one thing that you can do is go tracking. Go to a public park, someplace that has trees and other plants, grass, soil. Then you're going to be able to find um, squirrel, squirrel chews, chew traces on acorns. You'll be able to be a good nature detective hmm. just in your local park. Another thing you can do is go for a walk on sidewalks and then look at the sidewalk and look for tracks. I also this morning stared at the sidewalk. <laughs> cool. And by staring at the sidewalk as I'm walking along, I found tracks. So I found cat tracks, dog tracks, different types of dogs, and best of all, morning dove tracks. Oh. Preserved in the sidewalk. Wow. So that meant the concrete or cement was wet at the time those tracks mm -hmm. were made. So they're like pre-fossilized. Yeah. So kids, you can be your neighborhood ichnologist and study trace fossils in your neighborhood. Whoa! <laughs> ancient dogs, ancient <laughs> bats, ancient <laughs> birds. Your assignment, your mission, is to go for some walks. Now, you've already been going on Wonder Wanders, remember? So now you are ready for advanced noticing. If you can make it to a public park, that's great. And look for all the bazillion signs of life all around you. Maybe it's a bird's nest, or some bees, or worm poop, or maybe like a little hole in the ground where a chipmunk has its secret home base. Just don't tell anyone. If a park is too far away, that's totally fine. Just find a sidewalk. Kids can pick this up very quickly. You can be an expert tracker very quickly. Just takes practice, just takes being wrong a mm -hmm. lot, and then correcting your mistakes when you're wrong. Mm -hmm. And then just, then you'll develop those uh, pattern recognition skills. You'll be your neighborhood, your friendly neighborhood, technologist. Yeah. Another way for you to join the technology revolution is to go read all of Tony's books right now. Or we can start a book club, whatever you want. I even have a couple I can show you. That's one about dinosaurs uh, and dinosaur trace fossils. Cool. Tracks, burrows, nests, tooth traces, all the cool and, and poop mm. and paleo poop. <laughs> so this is Dinosaurs Without Bones. Is If you don't have dinosaur bones, how would you know dinosaurs existed, how they behaved, where they were? This was a fun book to write along those lines. So if people are, and it's PG-13 rated. Okay. For parental guidance suggested. Okay. This is one that came out uh, just three years ago. This is called The Evolution Underground. Mm. It's about burrows and burrowing animals through time. All kinds of burrowing animals, but also the history of burrows through geologic time. This was a fun book to write, too, because it answers the question, how did life survive all of those mass extinctions, and what lessons can we learn from burrows going into our future? But then my newest book is Tracking the Golden Isles. And this just came out like, Ooh. those are alligator tracks. Oh. And that's my wife, uh, Ruth, there for scale. She's, yes, and she's a cover girl. <laughs> so Tracking the Golden Isles is stories told by tracks and other traces on the Georgia coast. And then how these stories can relate to understanding 
the histories or her stories of the past leading into the present and then thinking about the future of the Georgia coast and other places as we go into the future with climate change, what lessons we can get from these traces. You know, it really doesn't matter if you're an extrovert or an introvert. You can enjoy ichnology with friends or all by yourself. In Tony's case, he has a lovely, wonderful wife named Ruth Showalter. And just like Tony, Ruth has this incredible ability to spread wonder and joy. It's totally infectious. And honestly, the two of them together are such a dream. Tony and Ruth have traveled all over the world together to investigate fossils and go on adventures. They're truly a power duo of science and art. Ruth does some amazing work exploring science and science communication through movement using a practice called interplay. I'm gonna include a link in the show notes so that you can check it out for yourself. When it comes to ichnology, it's all about using your eyeballs or your hands to be expert noticers. And if you can have fun in the process, even better. All right, guys, that is it for this week. Stay safe out there and don't forget to wear your mask. It's a sign of respect, you know? As always, the lines are open. Feel free to leave a voicemail at 415-IWANDER or you can shoot an email to wondercast at scienceatl.org. I will forever be accepting poems, drawings, secrets, whatever you got. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll see you next time. Don't even get me started on bird tracks. Oh my gosh, I love bird tracks. <laughs> <laughs> There's a robin, there's a blue jay, there's a crow. Ooh, that's cool. That was a hawk. <laughs>